Okay, well, I, I said I wanted to save this till the end so we'd leave on a more positive note. Uh, several people brought up, and as we mentioned at the top of the program, I was featured in one of the new episodes on, well, formerly the WWE Network. For those of you around the world, it still is. Here in the United States, we get the cock. But the second season the of Peacock the Peacock Channel, for anyone Peacock, wondering. Yes, yes, the Peacock Channel. Well, I, I, I'm website. on a first name basis. It's a nickname. I call them the Cock for short. One of these days they'll get on screen speed search. But anyway, <laughs> Ruthless Aggression season two, they're talking about that era. They mined all the programming they could get out of the Attitude Era. Now they've moved up to the next one. And this particular episode was titled securing the future and it was about the early days in the warehouse and the development of the or the the development of the developmental program and the way that things you know uh, transpired and i thought it was a great show and i've said this not just because i was on it and as I mentioned, it was old footage from a few years back. It wasn't something they came and shot recently. They've been planning this for a while. But I mentioned on the program before, the the jewel of the WWE to me is their production facility. Kevin Dunn aside, they have not only amazing equipment in their facility, but they got a lot of people that work long hours on logging this footage and doing all the things and they do do good documentaries and i've also mentioned on the show here geez not long ago that in the especially in the 90s a lot of people that worked at the studio bought kevin dunn's well we, we're not wrestling and they bought that line and some of them still do but over the years they've some have infiltrated working at the studio where they're actually they have respect for the business and they're fans of the business and they kind of know what what's going on. And they, they do do some good work with some of these things where they, they can't just completely toss out the company line, but they can get the point across that things may have been a little bit different looking back than what they were told. And this kind of, you were left with the flavor of that and this without them actually coming at, although they did come close to saying it, at the end, when I believe one of the quotes, Pat McAfee did the voiceover. But obviously the voiceover copy was written by someone and approved. And one of the quotes was, the original OVW class was carrying the company on their backs. At the same point that, uh, that's when Triple H and Michaels were like, ah, oh, we don't need to be in Louisville, we ought to have a real facility. We see what happened there. But anyway, they started at the beginning. And they showed uh, some tape, and it was off VHS, because uh, that's what we were using at the time, just to run a camera in the warehouse when they had camps with Dory Funk Jr. and Tom Pritchard. But they showed some of that uh, training footage, and then a, a clip where I mentioned that here was the problem training guys in a warehouse you had all of the employees come back from lunch standing around gawking you had people building sets i remember going in there one time to watch a workout and the smell of a combination of sawdust sawed wood and some kind of lacquer from whatever it was like poisonous you couldn't draw a deep breath and i'm and it just it was awkward it was really even though it was a private situation it wasn't conducive to learning as as good as something else could have been and that's where you know i went to jim ross and, and when i mentioned this before when i'd come thanksgiving of 97 home to visit and ran into danny davis at clarksville seafood an old place that we used to all go eat all the boys in the territory and he showed me his ovw layout and I said, here's my escape hatch from Connecticut. And I pitched the idea to JR. We need a place to train guys where not only can they do local television, they can wrestle in front of people, and they can also have a school with training classes. And Danny's doing all of that because Danny Davis had started when he retired from wrestling in 93 or 94, had started OVW here as a school and then started running a few shows with his first students. And then had gotten a a television program on the 
absolute lowest power station in Louisville, but there was a presence, right? So there was something to work with. Plus, Danny Davis is a brilliant trainer and a brilliant businessman. He had actually, before he got in wrestling, he had been the manager of, of a department store in his mid-20s in, uh, in near Jackson, Tennessee, where he was from, and he had business experience. So it wasn't like a fucking fly-by-night thing where somebody, I want to run this wrestling school because I'll be a star or whatever. He was doing it for a business. So anyway, that's how it got started. and. The one thing that I thought was confusing about this episode, and I'll try to explain it, is they did a couple of segments. You saw it with Orton and Batista. Everybody on their first thought when they pulled up to this old deserted warehouse and they're expecting a big training facility for the WWE and instead they're in this graveled parking lot in this old warehouse in this beat-up part of Jeffersonville, Indiana. And they showed some pictures of the outside of the old building and they showed the footage of the early stuff of Orton and Batista and Shelton and Lesnar that was the old building that was the building that Danny had for the original OVW before the WWE training program ever and I ever came down but then they they juxtaposed that well, I didn't juxtapose it there was it was like they mixed it in with inside footage of the new building in Louisville, over on Shepherdsville Road that we moved into in 2002, and that's the one that looks like a TV studio inside that Cena was mentioning everything was painted. Well, everything's painted black in both buildings. But uh, it was a more professional-looking place, and they were still talking about it like a dump. And for people who didn't know that there were two facilities, it would have been confusing. But everybody was right. When Orton and Lesnar and all the rest of them first showed up, it's like, what the fuck? Because that was where Danny was when he was running his own wrestling school and this opportunity came up. And a lot of people are saying, well, now, well, why didn't they move into a better place? We did three years later, because here's the thing. Danny Davis was the smartest motherfucker amongst all these people, including Vince McMahon. And you can't tell me any different. Danny had a building... It, we called it the quadrangle. It was a complex that was completely empty and a, like a hundred years old. And Danny was the only tenant and it was cheap. It was like 600 bucks a month. And that's where he did his TV and that's where he did house shows. And that's where he had his school sessions. It was practically free in, in all respects. Of course, the toilets didn't work most of the time. There was no air conditioning. There was very little heat. Uh, I think it was, was it Big Show or Mark Henry? They finally, when they came down, because they had big contracts, one of them, I can't remember who, and I don't want to short either one, but one of them bought a window air conditioner for the boys so they could put it in the locker room of the old building because it was 157 degrees in there. The point is, that building is what kept OVW in business until we established what we were trying to do. Because from a business standpoint, it didn't make any sense for Danny to move then because the original deal that Vince made with us was I got $750 a week, Danny got $750 a week, and OVW as a company got $500 a week for to supply this training service, and it was a six-month deal. Vince said, well, let's see how it works out. So for that, yes, I was going to move home because I saw OVW. I saw a chance to put something on television in Louisville. I saw there's the Louisville Gardens that Danny already has a, a relationship with, and they don't have any events going there anymore, so that place is dirt cheap. And we've got people in the radio stations here that are fans, and I saw what we could do in this location with a little time. So when I had to get out of Connecticut, so I said, okay. I said on the show, I said, I'll tell, uh, I told JR that you can tell Vince he only has to pay me half of what he's paying me now. Actually, it was more like 25% because $750 was half of the $1,500 a week that I was getting to be on the office staff, creative, announcing, whatever. And then I was also getting talent pool money as a performer, 
I said, fuck it. Let me just get to Louisville and we'll do this. Hey, can I jump in real quick and ask yes, a question? You can. Yes, you can. So it's a big pay cut for you. I know the happiness factor and peace of mind and being home and working with Danny. I mean, you had nothing but incentives. Yes. But it's a big pay cut. Contractually, where were you? You were still under a contract with them. How much longer did you have to go on that? Or did they just rip it up and give you something different? Um, well, they ripped it up and gave me something different. And as far as how long, uh, cause I had two contracts. I had the creative slash office type contract. And I had, um, I was still an independent contractor, as I've mentioned, and I had an independent contractor performer contract. There was, I signed, I'd have to go get the contracts out, but I signed the first one for the office work in February of 96. So since they renew every year, I think I'd probably renewed it in February. And the talent contract, I'd signed my first one in summertime, July of 93. So sometime in the summer, but they were, they were different times. I didn't give a shit, right? Because I figure if I stay here any longer, because Kevin Dunn's running me off most television, I'm not doing as much announcing as I was beforehand. I don't want anywhere near creative, whether they want me or not, because that's where Shit Stain and his dreadlocked partner, Fatso Ferrara, were. And I figured in the mood that I'm in, I'm going to flip and do something where I'm just going to have to go home. So this would be better for everybody. So that's why I pitched the idea. And besides that, moving out of Connecticut into a better house in Louisville that I was renting instantly saved me $1,500 a month. So what the fuck, right? Let me ask you one other thing. We've talked about the various reasons, and they're pretty well established as to why you would have wanted to do this. And you didn't really know what it would turn into exactly at that point, to be fair. I was going to be partners with Danny Davis. If we had money from the WWE, that was great. Otherwise, I was going to be partners with Danny Davis in a promotion and wrestling school in Louisville. That was already making a profit. How much of an incentive was it that you would actually get to be close to your mom for the first time in however many years? I mean, Jesus. Well, yeah. The early I mean, 80s. Yeah, that was the thing. I'd been gone from Louisville since 83. It's now 99. That's 16 years. And... You know, of course, with impeccable timing, I moved back and three years later she gets sick. But that was a big, a big deal just to be just to be more relaxed, be back in the wrestling business, because the WWE even back then was not the wrestling business. Get and and to bring as I mentioned, one of the happiest times of my life was bringing my mom to the Louisville Gardens when we had the sellout at Christmas Chaos, which was exactly uh, almost 27 years after she had first taken me and bought me a ticket as a fan, then I'm promoting a show and booked it and sold it out. So that and she was there. That was a bit, but yes, all of that. And again, I was looking at something long term to get started because I knew that no matter what I'm doing in the WWE in Connecticut, I need to plan for something long term because the thought of actually staying there and living there forever never crossed my mind. I took that job because I had to I had to pay the production company for the Smoky Mountain tapes and I needed to replenish my FIA fund. And so yes, but I never thought for a second I was going to be in Connecticut. That's why I didn't buy a house. I didn't do what Bruce Pritchard did and spend a lot of money on a fucking house. Were you pressured to buy a house or did you think you were pressured to buy a house? No, no, no. They never, no. That's one thing, you know, Vince had told JJ, well, buy the house and blah, blah, blah. And then had him, but they, but, and I'll tell you, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Vince did do one great thing for me because my credit was shit after Smoky Mountain Wrestling. So I was trying to rent the house that I ended up renting, but this shrew that owned it uh didn't want to rent to me because of my credit even though i offered to give her a better deal than what she asked for and then i told vince as well i found a house but she don't want to because of my credit well tell her you'll pay her a year in advance so well, i can't tell her that because i can't do that yes you can pal and he advanced me the money took it out of my check every week but that way i got the house i wanted so he got me in that but it didn't cost me you know, any uh, I could I could leave whenever I wanted. 
But that's always the move, not just even with Vince, but wrestling history. Get him to move to the territory. Yes, get him get to him buy to a move house. There. Yeah, you yeah. got him. Uh, but anyway, so that's the thing. So that was the vision that we had for OVW, and obviously that's the vision that JR knew about, and that's the way that we peacefully coexisted for so long because he knew that I came here to me and Danny to run our business and provide them a service. It wasn't their business. <laughs> and we offered several times, if you want to tell us everything to do, buy the fucking thing, and we will. And they didn't. But that's how it got started. And the old building, and then, you know, as several people said, the first year, Kevin Kelly and all the guys who would come down and Tom Pritchard, we can't let anybody named McMahon see this building. Well, why not? Then they ought to pay us more money. We could move into one. So finally, after three years, the initial six-month arrangement, three years, and we've sent them Lesnar and Orton and Batista and blah, blah, blah. Then, okay, they said, how can we get a new facility? And we said, well, give us a five-year deal because to rent a warehouse and customize it for television and everything else is going to be expensive and it's going to take a three- to five-year lease. And Danny, being the genius that he was, went and found a perfect warehouse in a great location that could be customized and made friends with the, the landlord. And was, he was there from 2002 until, what was it, Danny sold the company? 2008, he was there for 16 years. And at one point in recent years, Danny was way behind on the rent because he'd lost the the deals and the guy worked with him because he'd been a good tenant. And then he made it back up when things flourished again. But that's why we, Danny kept the business running. And my job was to be the director and screenwriter for the motion picture. Danny was running the theater chain in the studio. And that's what we did. And after three years, when we when they saw what we could do and the program had been successful, then that's when they signed a lease, or not signed a lease, but they signed a contract for five years in 2002, and Danny turned around and signed a five-year lease on the new location. And that was fine until, and I've, I've told the story before, when that time came up, they told Danny, go ahead and sign a new lease. Everything's fine. You're in our plans. And six months later is when they told him they wanted to move everything to Florida. He'd already put his name and his company's name, I was gone by that time, out of the goddamn, you know, he'd put his stuff on the line and they'd gotten out of the deal. So that's the way they, that's when I called Laurenitis up and left him another voicemail to say, you wonder why nobody wants to do business with you people. It's because the people that have helped you the most are the ones you fucked the first. He told somebody else, I'm trying to think who it was. It may have been Jerry Briscoe. I don't know. Somebody told me, Cornette, he sure has a fucking direct and straight way to get to the point, but sometimes he has one. <laughs> so anyway, so we got the new building and that's where the, the next crop came from. The, the John Morrison's, John Hennigan's and the Mickey James's and the other people that were, that were uh, quoted on the, on the program because then by that point in the when we first started like i said we had low low power television so we started working on the tv situation and we couldn't get one and we couldn't get one and finally old channel 34 from down in campbellsville that had been there forever and aired smoky mountain tv back in the early 90s and they at the time, the television station broadcast out of a fucking mobile home trailer. But there was a license open in Louisville, and that television station entered the Louisville market as the WB affiliate. Remember the old WB network? And all of a sudden, instead of old independent channel 34, it was WBKI 7 and had the strongest broadcast signal on a tower in the city of Louisville and full cable coverage. And when they went on the air, we got it. And from that point on for the next, what was it? That was, uh, it took me from the summer, from July of 99 to May of 2000. We aired our first program on that station. And it was on Saturday night at 11 o'clock for the next, I think, eight years as their highest rated program on Saturdays. And to the point where we were doing 
primetime two-hour specials on the same station when we'd be ahead of one of our big Six Flags events or one of our big gardens events. And they loved the program. Then the next step was selling Clear Channel Radio here in town that owned the Classic Rock and the Current Rock and Six Stations that they ought to partner with us in doing the big shows at the gardens, which they did. And we, we they would buy the shows and then we'd they'd sell the tickets, obviously. They'd get that. But we grossed for three shows we at the gardens in a 12-month period. We sold over 12,000 tickets and grossed $150,000. And the Christmas Chaos event, Clear Channel bought that one from us for sixty grand, but they made the money back not only with the with the ticket sales but the sponsorships. We had a Steve Austin six foot stand up in every Thornton store in in the Metro Louisville area, and then we got with Six Flags when they closed the gardens, and Six Flags contracted with us starting in two thousand and one. And then actually 2001, we did the original shows. 2002, we started doing them regularly. We do outdoor shows every other week from May to September at Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom. And they were paying us mid five figures for those shows. So once we got all those things in place and had local sponsors, then we could expand into a new building and running different shows and et cetera. So it was a process. But the thing is, the reason why I always put Danny Davis over, and that's why I have one problem. Danny's name was mentioned and his picture was shown, and he doesn't like to be on television, and he could give a shit whether they wanted to talk to him or not. But he should have got more credit, and Rip Rogers' name was never mentioned. And he's the one, by the way, trained Pat McAfee. Before Pat got in the system, he trained Pat because... Rip lives down the road from Patton, Indianapolis. They didn't mention Rip's name at all, but they were the two most important guys. Rip was training the guys first. Danny had stepped out of training as as he started taking more of the business, you know, uh, running more of the business. But they got the thing over. And also, Danny Davis was the guy that was running one of the only two full-time professional wrestling promotions in the United States with television and running a regular schedule that was profitable. Between 1999, when WCW started losing money, and fucking 2007 or 8 when they cut the deal. And it wasn't just because of the WWE deal. Danny Davis, we, we, would lose, we might lose money on a spot show that drew... 82 people, although I saw Danny make a $3 profit on a $103 gate one night. But that OVW and the WWE were the only two, as I mentioned, profitable full-time wrestling promotions in the United States for most of the decade. Impact was losing money. Ring of Honor was losing money. Nobody else was really running full-time, and if they were, they were losing money. WCW lost money for what the last year and a half they were around. So anyway, that was, we were running it like a business in that respect. And the way that I ran it, and this came through in the comments from people like Big Show and Mark Henry, we didn't run this like the performance center, because as you see the difference in the performance center, what you get versus a wrestling school, this was old fashioned wrestling training. Part of the good thing about it was it was in a warehouse. We weren't attracting any attention. People didn't know what was going on there because the general public was not allowed into the practice sessions or the training sessions. They were only allowed into the shows that we ran for the public. We presented training for professional wrestling like Vern Gagne did with Ric Flair and Ken Patera and the Iron Sheik and whoever else in his barn in Minnesota in the wintertime or Stu Hart's basement, or fucking Eddie Graham's goddamn the Sportatorium in Tampa, that where they did the TV taping, same situation as OVW. You're allowing guys to come into a secret society, and they're allowed to learn a trade that not many people at that point were well-versed in. And there are secrets like magicians or the mafia. You don't let them out. And I told the guys and taught the guys how to respect the business and how to make it 
as easy on themselves as physically as possible while still getting the point across and doing what they were supposed to do. And it's not about teaching moves. That's why I said it, if you have a training center, you can teach any body of minor athletic ability up to and including a chimpanzee how to do a lot of these moves. That doesn't mean they understand why to do them, when to do them, or what to do at what point or what the desired result should be. It's the psychology of, it's the way you think about wrestling and the way you think about performing for people without letting them know that you're performing, being genuine, making them believe in you. Those were the aspects of the business that we all wanted to teach because that's the way you train wrestlers. And both Big Show and Mark Henry. And this is not an indictment of them as talents. It's an indictment of the way they were broken into the business. Mark Henry had his first match on pay-per-view with Jerry Lawler, remember, in 1996. And Lawler worked with a fucking stick, right? So that wasn't bad, but... Then Mark got hurt in training. He didn't wrestle again for a year and a half. But there was very, there was only the developmental program at that time was in the warehouse. So he got right back on the roster and started wrestling again. He didn't know how to relate to the boys because he'd never been in the locker room. He sometimes came off a little Markish, got heat. It was all because he never had the chance to be trained and to break in the right way. So then. When he was sent to OVW, and he admitted it, he learned why to do things and how, when to do things, and he learned to get along, and it, it saved his career because it wasn't going very well until he got the training he should have gotten to begin with. The same thing with Big Show. He, he is, his first match was on pay-per-view against Hulk Hogan. And then then he's there, right? And he's very athletic, but he was thrown in on national TV to the Wolves, and he's admitted when he came to OVW, he had to break himself of some things, and he had to learn a little bit different way to do things, and it saved his career because he learned the whys and not just the hows. On this program, by the way, I saw Brian Gerwitz I may have met him in the past. The writers never came to OVW, maybe once a year. He might have been along. I don't know. He's such an easily overlooked fellow, but i he looks like Kevin Dunn's bastard son. I, I, now I want to see what everybody was talking about when him and Heyman got in the screaming fight and almost got in a sl slap fight at Titan Tower. I'd love to have seen that once I seen this little Weasley character, but he was the... <laughs> Gerwitz was the show business kind that he liked the tough enough. And they, they did a segment in this show about tough enough. And that was Kevin Dunn's baby. And he hired his unemployed friend, Big, which was a nickname and a description of his fucking head. Well, can, can you stop right there? Because there may yeah. be, because tough enough came up a lot, obviously, in this documentary. And there may be some people who go back and through whatever means, I don't know if they're on Peacock or anywhere else, go watch the old tough enoughs. And that's where a lot of us were introduced to this WWE production figure of Big, who was presented like he's been there for a while and he knows his stuff. It was the first I had ever seen of this guy or heard yeah. of this guy. No, he, he had as much to do with professional wrestling before that as I have with the space program. He was a guy that was in television production. It was from Baltimore. It was an old friend of Kevin Dunn's and he was unemployed and needed a job. So the people started thinking he had something to do with wrestling because he's a big, fat, bucket-headed fuck. But no, he didn't. I mean, it, it, there could not have been anyone with any less knowledge of any type of subject in professional wrestling than Big on a program where they're judging aspiring professional wrestlers. And it was a reality show. They wanted to do it for ratings. And that's what Kevin Dunn thought that wrestling school was, because none of them have any respect for the business. They think, well, we'll just train a bunch of guys and see what happens, and blah, blah, blah. OVW was a wrestling training program. Tough Enough was reality television. And they pretty much, without using those exact words, came out and said that and on the program here. But 
Tough Enough was the equivalent of OVW's amateur class. We had an amateur class throughout all the years we had the developmental program where guys could come in and pay rip a beginner's fee for the beginner's program. And those that was where you learned to take a bump without breaking your neck and lock up and headlocks and things like that. Those people didn't even make it onto OVW television. When somebody was actually ready to do jobs on TV out of the amateur class, I'd put them at the Derby Park flea market show and I'd watch them in person. I'd say, okay, then I let them do some jobs on TV. Those people in the amateur class got the same training as the tough enough guys did. And once again, it's not an indictment of Nydia or Maven or Hennigan or Matt Capitelli. Jackie, poor Jackie Gaeta, they made mockery of the fact that the tough enough people were thrown out on television for the WWF with very little training. And Jackie was the one that was featured on the most. She was a good, she wanted to learn and she was a good talent. Her wrestling was probably not the greatest, but she was a personality and a valet manager, whatever. But it wasn't fair to her to just have this shot of, yeah, shitty people. And it was always her. She was a nice girl, and we loved working with her. But that was tough enough was reality TV, and all the winners, after they were exposed on WWF television, they were all sent to OVW to learn. And and poor Matt Capitelli may have been the best talent of the bunch of them and got the brain tumor, cancer, and obviously since then has passed away. But he he stayed in Louisville. When he found a, he got a concussion one time in a training class and it got checked out. That's how they found the brain cancer. And he stayed here and went through his treatments and et cetera, and actually came back and at one point was helping coach one of the amateur classes to try to give back because he he would have been he would have been the best of the bunch. But anyway, nevertheless, everybody on this show said national TV is no place to learn wrestling. Wonder where they all heard that. They experienced it because they didn't have to because they had OVW. Now these guys are on NXT or AEW. Can't stick their thumb in their ass on three tries. And that's the impression that people are going to, is going to linger with people. That's one of the things I was going to say. I hadn't seen the Jackie Gata uh, tag team match footage in a long time. I think it was oh, her boy. and Nowinski versus yeah. Trish Stratus and Bradshaw. What, what a weird pairing on both teams that is. But there were moments, and it was bad. I hadn't seen it in a long time, but there were moments that looked just like some of the stuff we've seen in the women's division on AEW that got on TV. It yeah. wasn't that outrageous. It wasn't that dissimilar to some of the worst that we've seen. But, you know, that's that's the thing is, is it was too, we were trying to supply the WWE with talent and obviously also running our own business, and I didn't want shit on my television show. So I only put on people that that were ready for this level of exposure, but it's two completely different ways to train. We were training guys the way that guys trained to be wrestlers, professional wrestlers a hundred years ago in pretty much the same way. An experienced veteran saw a kid with potential and depending on whether it was the 1920s, the 1940s, the night, whatever the level of working was at that time, they were taught to respect the business, respect its secrets, not talk publicly about what went on behind the scenes, because that way it protects everybody's business. Here's how you work. But the overriding important thing is that people believe in you and what you're doing. And that's the way that wrestlers were trained for a hundred years triple h and Shawn michaels were always knocking us behind our backs up there well not behind our backs they were in connecticut we were down here but they were always knocking us so one thing you know prick michaels didn't like me and him and helmsley are friends i felt the same way about him so there you go uh but they have always wanted the nfl training program the big performance center that finally through marriage and accomplishment triple h was able to get done they wanted us at one time to put two or three rings in laurenitis did we said no danny danny davis said no 
everybody learns in the same ring. Everybody pays attention to the same thing. You don't have shit going on all over the place, especially in these warehouses. It's loud. Nobody can concentrate. The performance center for football or basketball or whatever, that's fine. The high quality weight training, the best sports nutritionists, the best sports athletes or sports phys physicians is what I'm trying to say. All the best equipment because you can quantify a professional sport. The guy runs a 40 yard dash in X amount of seconds. The guy hits the fucking tackling dummy according to our measurements at such and such pounds per square inch. It's a sport that is obviously completely tied to who wins and who loses and who's the best physically, and you have to think about things, but only in terms of plays that you memorize. There's no ad-libbing necessarily. That's the way you train professional sports franchises like football and etc. Professional wrestling is a hybrid of sports and entertainment. So you have to have athletes and you have to encourage them to stay in shape and you have to train them how to use their physicality safely uh, with themselves and their opponents. But you also have to train them how to be psychologists, how to think, how to portray themselves, how to put a match together, how to tell the story that you want the fans to pick up on. And you can't do that just in a warehouse. That's where you have to have live shows. That's where you have to have television. That's where you have to have people with experience teaching you how to get yourself over, not just a rule of thumb for everybody. You don't teach everybody to work the same way. You don't teach everybody to talk the same way. You don't write material for people and have them recite it the same way. You teach guys how to get themselves over and tell them what they're doing that's good for them and what they shouldn't do because it's not good for them and how to think and let, let them apply that thinking on their own. And you have to give them the, the opportunity in front of people to try all this shit out, but not in front of a national television audience because you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. That's why the flea market show was great. That's why the fucking spot shows in Ulytic, Indiana. You get 600 people in a high school gym. Some of these guys that have never been in the business before thought, my God, this is Madison Square Garden. And that's when they start getting confident and come out of their shell. So you train professional athletes in a, a place like that, but you it, it, training professional wrestlers in a sterile environment like that without live feedback and without the people being involved is like trying to train comedians in a fucking room with a bunch of comedians. Sure, the comedians will laugh at your lines because they are supposed to, just like they clap at the practice matches, but it's not like going out and working a fucking comedy club or going to the Catskills to a resort. Do they do that anymore, Brian, Mr. Northeast? There really aren't too many resorts in the Catskills anymore. Okay, well, then, Jackie, we'll never have another Jackie Mason. God damn it. No, we won't. But can you imagine trying to be an actor and the first part that you have is on Broadway or in a major motion picture? No, you need to go out and do the dinner theater in Shively, whatever the case. So that's the difference. OVW was a training school that tried to develop wrestling stars. The Performance Center is a training school that makes performers. And that's why they all perform fairly similarly to each other, unless you get the odd one that has that person, the, the champas, the breakers, that has the personality and the look and the different way of going about things. And they would prosper in any wrestling training program anywhere, whereas most of the guys just want to be performers and actors. And the difference also is, in OVW, you're going to respect the wrestling business. You're going to put the ring up and you're going to take it down. They've done that at the Performance Center too, but you're also going to kayfabe in public or you're going to get fired. If you do a fucking interview with the newspaper or the radio and you tell them the business is a work, you're going to get fired and run out of town. If you fucking don't respect the business that you're in here, then why should the WWE 
expect you to respect it. So they got that little bit of wisdom early. Now the guys go and show up at the performance center and they do all the interviews about how, well, here's another entertainer and everybody's all open and they're hoping to get a chance to do reality television in the future and entertain all the little rug rats and crumb snatchers sitting around and put smiles on people's faces. No, I was teaching motherfuckers, you are going to have conflicts with other big bad assholes and you're going to fight and you're going to make people buy tickets to see who wins and you're going to make them believe it and you're going to fucking bleed and sweat and pay the price as Ric Flair used to say and that's the way you train fucking wrestlers and I still stand the ones that we trained up against all the rest of them that have come since and apparently so does the WWE because their own documentary crew basically by the end of this program Everybody had said that OVW was the best training program they'd ever seen, and they produced all these stars, and then they have Triple H <laughs> saying, okay, now we're going to change the whole thing and do something different. And here's the Performance Center. I actually wrote down two quotes. I usually don't stop something to write down the quotes, but I laughed so hard. But I also thought they were interesting. At one point, they were talking about the various wrestlers that were developed in OVW, and they said how wrestlers were superstars were coming out of OBW and I wrote this quote as well as other experimental models what were the other experimental models that were producing WWE superstars well the other experimental models were Les Thatcher had Heartland Wrestling Association the HWA in Cincinnati and Les obviously has been a jack of all trades in wrestling he's a is he 80 or 81 now He's been in the business for 60 years. He was a star wrestler. He was an announcer. He's been a matchmaker, promoter, et cetera, et cetera. He had a school there similar to what Danny had set up. Cincinnati's 90 miles up the road. When, when WCW went under and they were absorbed, bought out, whatever, by the WWE, they had a bunch of guys that assumed the contracts. That's when they uh, uh, expanded to the HWA in Cincinnati. And for a while, the only Les didn't have a place he could do TV up there, so they did the HWA TV in our old building in Jeffersonville, the old Davis Arena, on Sunday nights. And we helped in terms of exchanging talent. They sent poor Les. He got all the cruiserweights from WCW and the Johnny the Bull Stambolis and the <laughs> the guys that they weren't they didn't give a shit about and they just had contracts and they didn't care he they got steve bradley i kept bringing steve bradley down to ovw shows and finally they they ixnayed the deal because they just fired most of the people that they'd gotten from wcw the underneath guys so they ixnayed less deal on him and the one guy i wanted was steve bradley and they sent him to fucking georgia because Steve and I had known each other from the Northeast anyway, and what a talent he was. But then they started, the Jody Hamilton started Deep South again. He had run Deep South Wrestling as his own promotion back in the late 80s, early 90s, whatever. And I don't want to say anything bad about Jody. He was The assassin was an all-time legendary heel, and he was a great talent, etc. But they didn't run a good wrestling school nor a good local promotion and they couldn't they never got broadcast television they were on a local cable thing in mcdonough they couldn't draw any crowds they couldn't get any sponsorships and they got tons of heat with the office and finally that's when they went the the wwe office went down un, under cover of darkness one night and showed up early the next morning and told jody the deal was done and they had trucks and they were going to take everything uh right then because they didn't want a blow up and they had tried god damn it was it tom pritchard i it may have been tom pritchard but they i'm trying i don't want to tell tales out of school but they knew jody had a gun in his office and they tried to get one of the people that wouldn't be noticed poking around to go in there and find the gun and remove it before they told jody they were closing the thing down because he only opened it because of their deal, and and the WWE kept him afloat, and as soon as they pulled the deal, they closed the thing again. OVW was a self, you know, standalone entity regardless. We liked it that we could all work together. Um, so there was, and there was that thing with that 
fucking hatchet headed uncircumcised prick Rick Bassman in <laughs> California. I guess that he, would be experimental. He would find guys that had good bodies, teach them how to write a check, and then try to sell them to the WWF and try to take some of their money. And that's all he was good for. But Bruce Pritchard loved having that organization as a developmental because he could fly out to Los Angeles and Bassman would take him around to strip clubs and places of interest. But that didn't last too long. Um, those were the other developmental programs. But again, they said experimental models. I didn't realize that meant just other, other developmental territories. Well, I, they, you could call them experimental because none of them worked. And most of them went up in flames, like most experiments involving dangerous chemical properties. The other quote I wrote down, I think was from the end, where they were talking about the current performance center i guess that's what it's called right the performance center yes performance center quote a program that enticed people to be a part of it that's what they were trying to turn it into <laughs> and i thought that was interesting because we know who they're going after and we heard that there was an edict you know avoid people who like wrestling try to recruit these athletes try to go after these people yeah. you're bringing them into a facility that may look somewhat similar to if you're a high-end athlete it looks somewhat similar to other places you've trained in but as we saw in their in their documentary, <laughs> sometimes it's better just to take that person and make them learn wrestling the right way as opposed to put them in a comfortable environment. Hey, the they got three or four rings set up. They got all the coaches. Every everything's going on. Nobody gets individual attention. Everybody, for good or bad, they either got praised or yelled at, but it was very individual, and everybody was working together. And everybody, it, it, I've had a lot of the OVW guys say that they had more fun there than anywhere else in the business, and it was like a family. And everybody was pulling the same rope because they, know, they knew that when they got to the WWE, there might be cutthroatedness and people trying to jockey for position or trying to take somebody else's spot that wasn't possible in OVW because I determined who was going to do what, and it was on the basis of their performance and how fast they were learning and how much the people were, the fans were taken to them. And that's all there was. And I had no reason to bury one guy or push another guy because it was advantageous to my business that everybody got over of course some people weren't going to be able to get over they they sent us the big russ mccullough's and the you know the other folks but you still had to try but some were going to make and make it and some weren't that's just the nature of of any school anywhere but that's that's the thing is is that the, the performance center and all those advantages has a lot of advantages but none of them relate to the wrestling business for the health of the performers, for the physical conditioning of the performers, for the, you know, the, the ego of the performers. Look at this great place I'm training in, but they don't learn as much about wrestling as they would if they were in a re small wrestling territory starting at the bottom like everybody did for 100 years. That's what we provided them. And that's how they learned to move up the card to carry more responsibility as they were featured more. We took Johnny Jeter from the Mark Magnus, Muhammad Hassan, I should say, from the amateur class all the way through to the OVW championship and the main events. And it was a two-year journey that they would take. And you can't replicate that in this type of training program and then putting guys on national TV on NXT with colored blotches all over them. I guess that's that's the point I'm making. And I know Pat McAfee wanted to mention Rip Rogers more, but Rip also got tons of heat with the WWE office because <laughs> they would hear anything that he said. And they're like, you can't say that. Well, he's been doing it for years and he's trained some of the best talents in the business. And Danny Davis said he was, and I have to agree with uh, Tom Pritchard is a, a better trainer than Rip Rogers in terms of polishing a star that's gone past the beginner stage, to break somebody in and give them their basics and tell them how to think about the business, Rip may be the best trainer in wrestling. 
but he's also, he'd say the same thing to the girls as to the guys. You're fucking rotten, you fucking douchebag, you fucking <laughs> girls or guys. He'd call them a <laughs> if they were a girl or guy. You fucking <laughs> you fucking douchebag, you fucking rotten. It fucking sucks. Get out of here. I'll fucking show you. And he'd get in and show them. And then he'd pat them on the back and take them out for ice cream when they did good. But he's a Who fucking complained? coach. Who complained? Oh, ton. I can't remember specific names, but they we would get calls all the time. Rip can't talk to people like that. Well, he can and he does. If they don't like it, they <laughs> should take up quilting. This is a wrestling school. Hey, you know, referencing the early part of the documentary, how many more people do you think need to be dead before the real story of why the funking dojo ended comes out? Um, I think it's about time right now. Uh, they got fed up with Marty, Dory's wife. She fucking called constantly complaining and bitching about everything. Dory Funk Sr., uh, Dory Funk Sr., Dory Funk Jr.'s nice guy, of legendary talent. But he was letting Marty, Marty came up to the camps. I heard a specific story. I heard a specific the incident. The t-shirt? The t-shirt? The t-shirt and the remark she made. Yes. The creative services department in the Stanford office, because there was a camp that Dory and Tom had held, and I think it might have been the one with Kurt Angle, and and maybe you know Rhino had might have been there, and I can't remember who all else, but it was people, Christian Edge, people you'd recognize, six or seven or eight of them, and so the creative services department worked up a little sweatshirt design with caricatures of dory and tom and the students in that camp and made like a dozen sweatshirts just as a nice thing to give to the guys that came in the camp marty called the office and complained that it made dory look bald he only had one squiggly <laughs> hair it was a caricature and dory is bald but he had one squiggly hair and she complained about the shirts and wanted him to redo the shirts <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when I told, I swear to God, if I'm lying, I'm flying. And when I told Jr. about this idea, I said, I've talked to Danny Davis. I said, Louisville, I said, the guys can live cheaper than they, they because they would need to live there. You're bringing them up now and putting them in a $150 a night hotel because that's all there is within 20 miles of here. I said, they can get apartments for $500 a month in Louisville. They can live there. They can train. Dory can fly up from Florida in half the time to Kentucky as he does, and you won't have to spend as much money to put him up, but it'll all be cheap. And that's what he said. Well, Dory might not be continuing. Why? Marty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you knew right away. <laughs> well, you know, it just... She, I was back. There. See, I I didn't just hear stories. I was backstage at a lot of dentist shows. Yeah, I was in the back for a lot of those shows. But that's the thing is that sometimes the office loves dealing with an individual, Ricky Steamboat, Dory Funk Jr., possibly Cody Rhodes, but they just don't want to deal with their wife. Especially when the wife is doing all the husband's business talking. Or in the case of Bagwell, that was the rib Mrs. Bagwell is because his mother kept legitimately it with a straight face calling the office, suggesting different things that they should do for Buff Bagwell in Atlanta. And of course, that immediately got around because that was you couldn't keep that a secret. So that's but anyway, back but to just the, the idea, the idea that it was, you made him look bald. He's looked like Charlie Brown since 1968. I know. What the fuck? <laughs> that's what gets me. It's not just like, oh, she was acting nuts. That's the issue she raised. That's the hill she wanted to die on, to use Jim Ross's favorite phrase. <laughs> uh, but anyway, but it was, it was a nice documentary special. Brought back some nice memories. Brought back some more unpleasant memories. But that's the, that's what we've done. They, and they, they don't want a wrestling school now because they don't want wrestlers because they don't think they're wrestling. And they're not wrestling. They should be. But they're not. It's not. But the, the disconnect is they think there's something better than wrestling. And when in actuality, there's something much more boring than wrestling. But they're not going to have a wrestling school anymore because they're not. They're training entertainers and actors and Cirque du Soleil performers who are interchangeable and do what they're told and they're happy to be there. And 
you know, there's, and, and that'll last until they CGI everybody. Whereas we taught wrestlers not only how to wrestle, but how to be wrestlers and how to think about wrestling and how to take care of themselves. And sometimes we taught people how to say, you know what? Fuck you. I ain't doing this shit. Cause there's times I would tell guys, look, you got to get along and you got to do what you need to do. But at some point you need to draw the line and say, okay, I'm not happy with this. And this ain't going to be good for me and do what Mick Foley did on a couple of different occasions in Atlanta when things weren't going favorably for him and say, rather than stick around here and be beat to powder, I'll go do something else and make myself and get myself over and come back in a better spot. And the office didn't like me telling guys that. And the office didn't like me telling guys when the office was doing things that was detrimental to their future. But me being the honest prick that I am, I couldn't help it. You know, my other, my last takeaway from this documentary was the real documentary I'd like to see. And I have hoped that it could happen right now because of people realizing how fair use works. If you're making an actual documentary film, the OVW story. Like you said, all the characters who were there, they didn't even touch on who the biggest stars were in OVW itself. The Rico Constantinos, the Danny Bashams, uh, the, excuse me. The, the Damager. The Damager, the Doug, Doug Bashams. Basham. Nick Dinsmore, Rob Conway. They can't do that because they ruined the best quality talent by either not bringing them up when they should or giving them goofy gimmicks. And I've told that story, and I'm not going to go into it here, where our fans, when we would do surveys, their major complaint was they would write in, WWE making our favorite wrestlers look like idiots. Uh, but that was, and that was another thing that Danny and Rip had established, is obviously Doug Basham was Danny's first student, because Doug was his nephew. And to this day, Doug is probably still in the ring, not as a promo, not as a personality. I'm not saying he couldn't do those, but as a smooth, fluid, in-ring professional wrestling worker, the best guy probably that we ever had. But, um, and early on, he had a job at the Ford plant. I couldn't get him. And finally, they switched his fucking schedule where he wasn't working three to 11 he was working during the day so that i could bring him in but it took me a year to get doug basham and uh but danny trained danny and rip trained dinsmore and conway and then a year year and a half two years later they're the guys that are in the ring as rip his injuries caught up with him they're in the ring helping train the newer guys with rip instructing from the outside and then those newer guys Capitelli Dinsmore took a special interest in him and then Capitelli later on because of his health issues not able to be on the main roster he started t training the amateur class guys to give that back so you had within OVW for a period of seven or eight years there you had several generations try and give the succeeding generation a hand up with their experience that's the way it's supposed to be it's not supposed to be 20 years difference between the veterans and the fucking new guys because then you've completely disconnected everybody could get together in a common place there for quite a while and that was unusual these days